Well, this is our final week in our message series called City on a Hill. And this has been a lot of fun because I love talking about One Church. Um, I love One Church. Anybody else love One Church? Yeah, it's incredible to be a part of what God is doing online and in all our outposts and to get to celebrate that and to think about our core practices and the ways that we worship Jesus and the ways that we share his love. And so as we've looked at everything in this series, we've, we've taken a little look at communion, baptism, worship, community, prayer, giving, and outreach. And I, I want you to know that all those activities and all those core practices that we do really are about coming to the final thing we're going to talk about. And that is this word evangelism. All right, let's try to say that out loud. Evangelism. Evangelism. All right, that's kind of a, a foreign word in our cultural context. Evangelism is kind of a churchy word. Maybe you don't see it anywhere else, but it's actually a neat word. That's why I like to go ahead and use that. Like sometimes we might avoid churchy language because it's confusing and not helpful. Uh, but when you get a really cool word, I like to use it and define it. And so evangelism actually just means to share good news. It actually, if you were to look at it, it means good newsing. What do you think about that? Good newsing. So it's the action of sharing good news or good newsing. So try saying good newsing. Good newsing. All right. So we get to be good news people in a world that is in really desperate need of some good news. All right. So I, I think this is exciting. If we look at our, at our world and we say, okay, our world really needs some good news. And when I talk about our world, I mean like our, our homes. Does your family need some good news? Anybody's family need some good news right now? Yeah. Do your neighbors need some good news right now? Yeah, how about the people you work with? Could they use some good news? People you go to school with? People that we are, are living with in our communities, could they use some good news? How about people online? Could they use some good news? Yeah, well, we're, we're good news people. That's who we are. And, and we get to go about the business of good newsing or evangelizing. And so all these other things that we do, the communion, baptism, worship, community, prayer, giving, and outreach, they all help us in sharing good news. You can see, that's the mission of the church. The mission of the church is, is to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is called the, the Great Commission. This is what Jesus left for us to do, to go into all the world, to go in all your world and all your families and all your neighborhoods and all your workplaces and schools and communities, to go into your world and make disciples. This is the mission of Jesus and what he's entrusted to us, good news people, to go about the business of good newsing or evangelizing, to be evangelists, people who share good news. And so all these other things that we do is they connect us to God and they connect us to people and they connect us to the mission of Jesus. This is all about our mission to reach the most people in the shortest time. And both of those things matter. So we pray for one at one church. That's what we do. It goes like this. God, please give me one person to share your love with. It's the one thing that we ask everybody to do, and it's something that anybody can do. And so I'd love for you to do it with us right now. Let's pray that together. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Now, this prayer right here is a prayer that connects us to the very heartbeat of God. And sometimes I like to describe it this way. It's a, a one prayer does it all kind of a thing, which is nice. Uh, a bit of a one-stop shop. When you, when you pray for one, um, we get to experience the great commandment. The great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so as we pray for one, God, please give me one person to share your love with. Well, you can't share what you don't have. And so now we are, we are open to God's love. We value God's love. We treasure God's love. Uh, we're desperate for God's love. What we were asking for is God's love, the very thing that he wants to lavish on us. And we receive God's love. And this is the love that we give back to him. And then we also love our neighbors as we love ourselves. The great commandment, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. And so our relationships change. The way we look at people change. Instead of having our relationships being transactional and seeing people as, as objects to be manipulated uh, for our, our benefit or people to be uh, avoided because um, <laughs> they're troubling or annoying or, or destructive. Instead of that, we see them as objects of God's love moving through us, and it changes the way we see them and the way we interact with them. So we connect to God, we connect to people, and then we also connect to the mission of Jesus to go into all the world, the, the Great Commission, and make disciples, to share with them that, that God is for them, not against them, 
that God has made a wonderful way through his son Jesus, that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, that God has made a glorious, wonderful way for us to be with him forever, to know who he is and who we are in relationship to him and to understand that we are adopted sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and that there is a place in his house and a seat at his table for us. And this is the good news that we get to share. And so our memory verse for this series, City on a Hill, is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. And I'd love for you to say this out loud wherever you are. Let's say this together. It says, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. And so this is the nature of who we are as the family of God. We're a light of the world. The, the love of Jesus is in us. He's, he's given us his love. He's given us his mission. He's given us the best news the world has ever heard. And now we get to share it. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And so as we come together as one church, and we do that in the regional context that we're in, at our outposts and online, then the light and the love of God flows and is seen and more people can connect to him and we do want to reach the most people in the shortest time. And so we want to leverage every resource that we can. We want you to love Jesus more than you've ever loved him before. We want you to pray like you've never prayed before. We want you to connect with him in communion and, and connect with one another in groups and experience rooted. And we want you to give like you've never given before. And we want you to worship and exalt God like you've never worshiped before because all these things work together to help us share good news in a really, really good way. And as we share good news in good ways, God is reaching into our world and people are getting to meet Jesus. And so this is a lot of fun. So when it comes to evangelism, what is it? It's sharing good news or good newsing. Who should do it? Uh, well, anybody who has good news should probably share good news. Does that sound like a good plan? <laughs> Like, if you have good news, you should probably share good news. I mean, what kind of person has good news and is like, I got something good? And you're like, oh, really? What is it? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> that's, not, that's not nice. <laughs> that's not cool. If you got good news, you should, you should probably share it. You probably want to share it. That's kind of the nature of good news. You know how when you got good news and you just can't contain it and you get home and you're just kind of bubbling and you just can't wait to get it out. And they're like, what's going on with you? I've got good news. We love to share good news because people love to hear good news. And so if you've got good news, then by all means, share it. Where, when, and how should you share good news? All right, right time, right place, right way. Where, when, how, right time, right place, right way. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, listen, anytime that, that there is an opportunity to share good news, take advantage of it. And share that. And, and we want to do it in a good news way. So the, the worst thing you could ever do with good news is make it sound like bad news. So I, I'll be honest with you. The, the local church has kind of been notorious for doing this. We like to scream and yell at people, give them a little turn or burn kind of thing. Uh, a little like, you know, repent or you're going to burn in the fires of hell and, and just try to scare the hell out of people. And it's, <laughs> there's, there's been a lot of that. And I know, I know, and, 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 and maybe, that's what you're, maybe that's what you're looking for. I'm just going to tell you, like, like, hey, could we just, could we share good news in a good news way? Uh, like, like, hey, like, we're already experiencing hell. By the way, hell is separation from God. All right, and this is a big deal. It's a big deal to God, and this is a big deal to me, and this is a big deal to his church, and I hope it's a big deal to you. Hell is separation from God. And when people don't know who God is and who they are in relationship with them, and that this God is for them, and that he has sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for them, to take our sins and all the things we've done and all the things that have been done to us and all that guilt and shame and pain, and he's put it to death on the cross, and he's dealt with it once and for all and paid the penalty and the wages of sin, which is death, and it's buried, and it's it's dead and it's not coming back again. This is a wonderful, glorious way. And this is the best news that it's based on grace, unmerited favor, the free gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. There is no arrogance. There's none. There's none. I'm better than you. There's no, my good works have done this. There's no, God owes me. There's no, you better be like me because I got it all figured out. It is good news that there is grace 
And this grace is available, and this grace has been extended because God so loved the world that he sent his son, Jesus, and God still so loves the world that he has his church in this world, and that is you and me, and we are going about the business of good newsing. Never, ever make good news sound bad. Don't do it. And so we, we want to be respectful of people. That's why even when I say right time, right place, like what's going on? What's the social dynamic? What's happening there? You know, let, let's not get in arguments. Like, please, I, I don't, I mean, I've just never experienced, I've never argued anybody into the kingdom of heaven. I just, I'm not, I don't know. I don't, I've not seen it. I've not done it. That's kind of the cool thing about good news. You don't have to fight about good news. You can just share good news and people can either receive it or, or not, but you don't have to fight about it. And you don't got to get all bent out of shape and upset. We don't have to, to be all angry about it. Instead, we can just share good news in a good news way, right time, right place. Sometimes like when, I, when I'm sharing good news with somebody or maybe they got some questions and I'm talking about Jesus and in the course of a conversation, they essentially deny Jesus three times in that conversation. I'm like, hey, you wanna talk about something else? What have you been watching on Netflix? I'll straight up change the subject. Like, I, I don't want to sit here and just keep making their hearts callous and hard. You know how you get, you know, you, you get a lot of friction there and it just builds up calluses and you become desensitized? Let's find, you know what? Hey, have, let, let, let's talk about golf, let's, sports, anything. And then you know, maybe we'll talk about how the Celtics are terrible, whatever you want. <laughs> like, but then, and then another time, another place, like I'm not giving up. I'm not done, I'm not like, well, I guess you just don't care. <laughs> you didn't want my good news. I tried. Lord, please give me another one. <laughs> that one didn't work. No, it's like, okay, yeah, no, we're, we're all right. Uh, yeah, well, try again next week. I'll, I'll send you a text tomorrow. Hey, thought about you while I was praying this morning. Well, you know, Jesus loves you. Don't care. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So right time, right place, right way. And why? Because people are so desperate for good news. They're so desperate. And those who I think fight it the most are the ones who may be the most desperate. And so be patient, slow down. Let's dig in a little bit here. So we know that evangelism connects us to God because we do what Jesus did. Jesus came to preach good news to the poor. When Jesus was asked, like, like, what are you doing here? Like, they wanted more miracles and they wanted more healing. And yeah, Jesus could heal because he had compassion. That's the whole thing. Like, all these miracles were based on compassion. And Jesus had compassion on people. But what he really came to do was to preach good news to the poor, the spiritually poor. The ones who were, were far from God and, and, and distant from him and disconnected and didn't know that they belonged and that there was a way. This is what he came to do. And so as followers of Jesus, then we're gonna do what Jesus did. So we're gonna read one verse of scripture. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And I'm gonna read it a few different times and we'll start and emphasize the first part of it in this first reading. It says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. All right, I want you to read that first part out loud with me. It says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. All right, so let's stop right there. This is really key and central. First and foremost, when it comes to evangelism and sharing good news, you can't share what you don't have. And so the good news is that Jesus is Lord. And if Jesus is Lord, that means that you don't have to be Lord and we don't have to fight against him anymore and we don't gotta carry the weight of the world on our shoulders and we don't have to have it all figured out and we don't have to fix everything and, and everyone and make sure that everyone's got it just right. We can trust him because Jesus is Lord. So in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Remember that he is Lord. That's the thing about praying for one. When we say, God, please give me one person to share your love with. We're just saying, hey God, you're Lord and I want in on what you're doing. We're asking him to do the very thing that he wants to do. So in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Lordship is the key here. 
If Jesus is Lord, by the way, then we will do what Jesus did. And what Jesus did was he evangelized. He was good newsing. He was letting people know that, that he was here and that a sacrifice for sin once and for all was going to be made. This is what he came to do to save the world. And now we are bearers of that good news and, and we get to share that. So is Jesus Lord? If he is, then let's get on with the business of the Lord. Now the Lord's business is to save the world. But listen, if you don't wanna be about the master's business, then you have no business being in his business. Just want you to think about that for a moment. This matters. You see, like, if, if we don't want to be in the master's business, then we have no business being in his business. And so that, that's where we get this whole thing mixed up. When, when prayer and everything else is more about, hey, God, I need you. I, I, I'm actually Lord, and I'm going to tell you what to do. And your hearts revere Christ as Lord. And let's get on with the master's business. The master's business is to share good news. That's why all these other activities, the giving, the worship, the praying, the, the community, uh, the, the, uh, the communion, the baptism, all these other things really are helping us with the business of good newsing, sharing good news, just like Jesus would. This is the very thing that came to do to save the world. And so let's get on with the business of it and not make it about something else. All right, so evangelism connects us to God. Evangelism also connects us to people because those are the people we're sharing the good news with. And our world is desperate for hope. Would you agree that our world is desperate for hope? It's a silly word oftentimes the way we use hope. Yeah, I want you to start paying attention to how often you say the word hope and what it is you say you're hoping for. It's kind of wild. I, I found that I find myself saying it like, like silly, crazy things. Like I go in the gas station. I'm like, I really hope there's hot dogs on the little thing. Because there's never hot dogs on the thing. And I love a gas station hot dog. I know that makes me crazy. But that's a weird thing to hope for. Like, I hope there's hot dogs on the thing. <laughs> I find myself saying all these things that I, I hope for, and they're, they're like that, hot dogs on the thing. And so start paying attention to what you say you hope for, because what we really hope for is our, is our hope is in Jesus. Our, our hope is in his kingdom. Our, our hope is in, in, in being a part of his family and a part of his mission. And we have a hope that is an anchor for our soul that will not disappoint. See, the greatest enemy of faith is misplaced hope. When we keep putting our hope in things that God never promised, like hot dogs on the thing, when we put our hope in things that God didn't promise, that's a misplaced hope. And it keeps leading to disappointment. And that disappointment leads to despair and it drives out hope. There's no wonder our world has no hope because we keep putting our hope in silly things. Put our hope in Jesus. And we can share this with others that they can put their hope in Jesus. And this is a hope that does not disappoint. And so let's read that, that passage again. Verse 15, it says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. All right, so now that middle part, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So let's get ready. If we're gonna be good newsers and go about the business of good newsing and be good news people in a bad news world, then let's get ready. And that's the cool thing about praying for one every single day. God, please give me one person to share your love with. This is a prayer of preparation. This is saying, God, I went in on what you're doing. This is what I'm really caring about. And there's an expectation that God's gonna say yes. You ask him to give you one person to share his love with that day. Guess what he's probably gonna do? I mean, you're actually praying the expressed will of God into your life. It's a little bit like, like a teenager, you know, coming up to their mom on a Friday night. And uh, mom's like, hey, you going out tonight? Uh, no, mom, I was just wondering, would it be cool if instead of going out with my friends, if I, if I stayed home and cleaned my room? <laughs> what is the answer to this question? <laughs> yes. Uh, are you okay? It's probably followed up with some diagnostic questions. But yes, like, of, of course, yes. Like, God, will you give me one person to share your love with? He's like, yes, let's do that. I would like to do that. And so now there's an expectation. My head is up. My eyes are open. My heart is prepared. There's an expectation that God will answer this prayer. So let's get prepared and be prepared. So what does that look like? Well, define your hope. Let's stop misplacing our hope and all those silly things. That's why I want us to pay attention. Where are you using the word hope? Every time it comes out of your mouth, every time you hear it, grab it, pay attention. Is, what, what was it? 
Because that, that misplaced hope can be such a tricky thing. So let's define our hope. Be sure that your hope is in Jesus. Be sure that your hope is in his grace. Let's not, let's not deviate from grace because this is where good news becomes bad news is when we start deviating from grace. We start with grace. We're like, grace, woohoo, I need grace. Yes, they're the grace. Grace is excellent. And then we're in grace for a little bit and we start to, to live a little bit differently and we got God's love in us a little bit. And all of a sudden we're like, yeah, I'm doing all right. I don't think I need grace anymore because I'm awesome. And then we leave grace behind and we start drifting into that kind of judgmental thing where we start comparing ourselves to others and being like, okay, yeah, maybe I am a little bit of a jerk sometimes. Maybe I am a little bit judgmental, but look at those losers. And then, then we start living like that. And so we start looking down at everybody, people who think differently, people who look differently, people who sin differently, people who act differently. We're looking down on them, comparing ourselves to them because we don't care about grace anymore. We forget that we are utterly dependent on grace. And we go right back to that old mindset of saying, well, I'm a good person and God owes me. Oh, no. No, God doesn't owe us anything. He gifts us. And we receive. And then we get to give. And so define your hope. Make sure that it's in the grace of Jesus and not on your ability to, to navigate being, you know, something on your own. God uh, initiates our salvation. He maintains our salvation and he completes our salvation. That's good news. That's good news. It, he does this. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the father. He has done this. He has done it and he's done it for you. Define your hope. Make sure your hope is in Jesus. Practice your story. Yes. Practice it. Testify. That's what, that's what it means. Like if you're going to give testimony, I, I hope none of you have ever had to do this, like go to, <laughs> go to court to give testimony. But if you're going to have to go to court and give testimony and it's some kind of big thing and there's all kinds of really high priced lawyers involved, they're going to like brief you ahead of time. You've seen the, the TV shows at least. And they're going to pull you into a room and they're going to do a deposition and they're going to go through all this stuff. And then they're going to brief you and they're going to give you the questions and they're going to practice. And you're going to practice telling that story and you're going to get it right. You're going to tell it the same way over and over again for a silly little legal thing. What about for the greatest news ever? We're going to be haphazard in how we share good news? Always be prepared to, to give a reason for the hope that you have to everyone who asks. Somebody comes up to you and you're like, man, what's up with you? You, you like have hope? Why, why do you have hope? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> like, what, 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 do you, what do you mean you don't know? Like, you're like one of those, you're like one of those Christians, right? Yeah. Hey, don't you go to the, the, that one church? Yeah, I go to that one church. <laughs> well, what's the, what's the, you have your story? You're ready to, you tell your story. And that's the other thing about being prepared to tell your story. Make sure you have a story. Just like we're going to revere Christ Jesus as Lord and we're going to set him apart as Lord in our hearts. Okay, now what's your story? And not just the, the old story. What's the new story? That's the cool thing about good news. It needs to be good and it needs to be new. So how is Jesus still good news for you today? I mean, if there hasn't been an experience with Jesus in the last 20 years, well, I got saved when I was four. <laughs> He's been lucky to have me ever since. <laughs> Riveting. <laughs> like, what's he doing in your life? How's he speaking to you? How's he revealing himself in the scriptures or in worship or through other people that you're connecting with? What are you seeing him do in your community, in your world, in your family? Good news. What's your story? So be prepared. Practice your story. Share it over and over and over again. And then share what you know. Share what you know. Because that's the thing. The, uh, here's one of the ways that the enemy works to keep us from sharing good news. He makes us freak out about evangelism. And so that's why we, we have to have an evangelism class so that we can teach you all exactly the right things to say at the right moment, the right time. And if you don't say it in these ways, in the magic words, giddy bobbity boo, <laughs> then nobody's getting saved because evangelism can only be done by the experts who have completed the class and have the certificate. 
Now, I'm not anti-class, I'm not anti-learning, I'm not even anti-certificates, really. But I'm not sure how helpful that is. You can get all worried about what you don't know. Well, I don't know. What if they ask me something I don't know? What if they ask me a question I don't know? I'm ready to empower you. What do you do if someone asks you a question and you don't know the answer? I don't know. Everybody say it with me. I don't know. That's it. I don't know. They ask you some off the wall. Oh. Well, if God is all-knowing and all-powerful and he can do anything, could God create a rock so big that he wouldn't be able to move it? Hmm? 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 I don't know! I also don't really care. I got some good news to share with you, though. You want to hear that? And, and so uh, share what you, what you know and stop worrying about what you don't know. You can say things like, I don't know, let's explore that together. Are you really interested? Do you really want to find out? We can dig into that. I mean, you got Google, don't you? <laughs> Type that in the search bar. Do a little reading. Watch a YouTube video. <laughs> Ask some questions. Talk to somebody. There's all kinds of things we can find out, but just share what you know. And then evangelism connects us to the mission of Jesus, to share good news in good news ways. To share good news in good news ways. Never, ever, ever, never, ever make good news sound like bad news. And so one more time, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. But do this how, with what? But do this with gentleness and respect. Oh, so important. Not, not harsh, not argumentative, not beating people. Please don't beat people up with good news. I mean, that, that's like what you do with a newspaper with a dog who's wet the floor or something. That's how the church has treated good news sometimes. We rub their face in the mess they may have made and, and then beat them up with good news. No. Oh, this is good news. God has taken the mess and he is, he's taking care of it. And we want people to turn their eyes to Jesus and to look full on his wonderful face and to receive the grace that he has for us. To do this with, with gentleness, to recognize that, that people may have encountered good news shared in a bad news way. There's a good chance they have. Like, to be aware of that, to hear their story, to say, you know, what have you experienced? To be gentle, to say, oh, what, are, what, have, what have you encountered? What do you know about God? And to listen and to care and to help process what they've experienced and, and the encounters they had. And sometimes to say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that happened. I'm so sorry you experienced that. I'm so sorry that sometimes we Christians totally blow it. I'm so sorry. Can we, it's okay, can you try, can we try saying I'm sorry? I'm so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To be gentle. That's not what God intended. He really loves you and he's really for you and, and he really wants you to know and receive his love and, and, and his lordship and his grace because his, his commands are a blessing, not a burden. Not to beat you up, but to lift you up. And to do it with respect. This is a, this is a big thing, respect. It's like giving somebody directions like if, uh, if I wanted to give you directions to my house, which I don't. Uh, <laughs> but if I wanted to give you directions to my house, the, I got to ask a question first. The question, first question I got to ask is, where are you? Where are you coming from? A lot of times we're trying to give people directions uh, into a relationship with Jesus, and we don't know where people are coming from yet. Where are you at? Like, what do you know about God? What do you believe about God? What do you think about God? Like, to be respectful. Now listen to what they have to say and then, and then say, oh man, yeah, you know, I don't see it quite like that, but let me share this with you. Or most of the time, what's really interesting is it goes more like this. I totally agree. 
and check this out, and this, and this. And sometimes it's like they, they want to tell me about the God they don't believe in. Turns out I rarely believe in that God either. <laughs> what, I mean, it's like here we are in this human experience to do this with gentleness and respect. Because this is exactly what Jesus did. You remember him? Remember him on the cross? Remember him on the cross, a criminal on either side? Stripped naked and beaten, a crown of thorns on his head and, and nails through his hands and his feet, struggling to breathe, to catch a breath, and with the little bit of breath that he could get in his lungs, with the people at the foot of the cross, the soldiers who were gambling for his underwear, and the people who were shouting and mocking and jeering at him, and with the little bit of breath he could get in his lungs, just to muster some words. What were the words he said? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Gentleness and respect. They don't know. Dad, they don't know. But they can. Because you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. You know what you are? You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. So set apart, revere Christ Jesus as Lord. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have to everyone who asks, but do this with gentleness and respect. Because this is who Jesus is and who we are as his church. And so today, as we share in a time of communion and remember, Jesus is for you, not against you. And he offers himself to you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you. And so as we take the bread, let's remember Jesus as our Savior, our giver of grace. And let's say yes to Jesus. We say yes to him. Yes. And let's eat. And as we take the cup, let's revere Christ Jesus as Lord. Jesus, you are Lord. And so let's ask him, Jesus, please give me one person to share your love with. Let's pray that together. Jesus, please give me one person to share your love with. And we drink to the king, the king of kings. Father, we thank you that we have the best news ever. And Lord, let us get on with the business of sharing good news in our world. And we ask for that in Jesus' name.